we have created this society. Not each one of us, but our past generations. We have those and us have created this present immoral, destructive society. And we are trapped by that society. That society is made by each one of us. So we are responsible for that society. Whether it is possible not to change society, but is it, is it possible to radically, deeply transform our condition, which is understand deeply our consciousness, which is what we are, is it possible to transform not into something, but to change, bring about a mutation in the very structure and nature of our consciousness? That is the problem. That is the crisis. It's not political crisis, economic crisis, or the crisis of war. But the crisis is in ourselves. The only real danger that exists is man himself. He is the great danger and we are pitifully unaware of it. We are the origin of all coming evil. The Earth, our home, a planet teeming with life, a place of great beauty and of great wonder, a world where ecosystem within fragile ecosystem combines to create a complex and delicately balanced web of life, a sympathetic mesh where the harmonious state of each organism is ultimately dependent upon the condition of the rest. A web in which the continued survival of each delicate strand rests entirely upon its symbiotic relationship with the environment in which it exists. Certainly the web of life has always been a fragile one, and yet for millennia it always functioned perfectly as everything within it held its own unique place and purpose. 
Within this web also dwells mankind. According to ancient Vedic texts, in times long past, man too lived in complete harmony with nature. For man also held his own place and purpose within the web. And so it continued for countless years, until there appeared upon the earth a new mindset in the consciousness of humankind. And with that mindset came a new type of organism. With that mindset came civilization and a system of organized rule based deeply in social structure. How much do we truly know about the past? There are, of course, a great many books that have been written on the subject by a myriad of scholars from the modern era. But how much do we really know to be true? Many books written in modern times are simply the author's interpretation of other books written previously by other scholars. But regardless of what is written in any book, the truth is that all of the information we currently have about our past is mysterious and fragmented at best. The theories presented in history books typically offer humanity a very orderly view of the past. And because these theories are presented to mankind hypnotically in printed form, most people automatically believe these concepts to be true. Yet upon further inspection, when one lifts their eyes from the printed page and looks deeper into the reality of their surroundings, quite a different picture emerges. And what about civilization itself? The Oxford Dictionary describes civilization as the process by which a society or place reaches an advanced stage of social development and organization. But how often does one ever pause to consider the questions of where civilization originally came from and how advanced it actually is? Obviously, human beings are very resourceful creatures and human ingenuity should not be underestimated. It is certainly reasonable to assume, for example, that groups of humans would form themselves into tribes and clans by which means all involved would benefit. But how did such groups then lead to something as entirely uncivilized and wantonly destructive as civilization as it exists today? Was it simply a natural progression? And if civilization didn't present a big enough issue, we are also presented with the question of technology. Where did it actually come from? Who was it who first pulled a rock from the ground? and decided to crush it down to its component parts, isolate those parts, and refine them into metals. In fact, how is the concept of metals even known, let alone the methods that are required for the extraction and refinement of such things? Would you, if left to your own devices, ever come up with a thing like metallurgy? Would you come up with advanced science, spy satellites, or nuclear weapons.
How did such inventions as these ever become part of the human psyche? But it doesn't stop at advanced technology. For in order for civilization to function efficiently, by necessity, civilization itself brought with it yet another organism, something more hidden, more mysterious, and more insidious than its parent. What it brought with it was a meme. A meme is described by the Oxford English Dictionary as an element of a culture or system of behaviour passed from one individual to another by imitation or other non-genetic means. Isn't this an exact description of the system that currently controls humanity? Is it not a fact that when looking at modern civilization and the social, political, financial and legal systems that dictate the behavior of those within it, what we observe is a system of control that is wholly fictitious. Is it not a fact that it is a system that functions entirely due to people's belief that the system itself is real? It is a system based entirely upon fear and a system that continues to function solely due to the energy it receives from the human beings within it. Yet the system itself is simply a name. We begin life with the world simply presenting itself to us. A reality that is open to individual interpretation. But then, at a very early age, we are taught to perceive things in a certain predetermined and socially acceptable way. The process begins first at home, where we are influenced by the beliefs, the attitudes and the behaviour of our parents and siblings. And then, as soon as we are old enough to be capable of independent thought, and have gained an acceptable degree of communication skills, We are immediately placed within a tightly controlled education system to then begin a process where our minds are carefully and deliberately moulded into a particular way of thinking. A process where little or no deviation from conformity is tolerated. Through a system of constant repetition, we are then taught that the world functions in a certain way and we are only considered to be functional ourselves when we believe and are able to repeat without question that which has been taught to us during our time within the system. Throughout the entirety of our scholastic years, any independent thought is frowned upon and instilled into each and every student is the belief that our success within the system is wholly dependent upon our ability to regurgitate on command that which has been taught to us. And we are told that upon leaving the education system, our path through life and our standing in reality itself will be determined entirely upon how economically viable our personal endeavours are.
we are taught that it is only through profit and through continual financial gain that our personal success will be measured. We are taught that we must either work for someone or we must strive to gain a position in society where someone else will work for us. But either way, all must work. We are essentially taught to be slaves who will spend the majority of life in the pursuit of paper or of digital credits. And through our belief that this system is real, we find ourselves living within a society that has been structured in such a way that were we not to dedicate our time to the accumulation of such things, then all that nature has provided for us, all that nature has provided freely for the benefit of all, will remain forever out of reach. Yet in pursuing such goals and the belief that doing so will enrich our lives, all we do is give power to the mean that enslaves us. And the price we ultimately pay is the connection we once had to the world around us. The price we ultimately pay is life itself. The entire educational, financial, legal, political and social systems that modern human beings are subject to from the moment of birth are all structured with a singularity of purpose, to perpetuate the meme. These systems are designed to ensure that each individual is kept locked into a left brain understanding of the world, is kept disconnected from the reality around them and that each individual grows into adulthood with the understanding that the meaning of life is the one with the most wins. But life is not a board game, and there is far more going on in the world around them than most people ever realize, because there is far more going on around them than that which can be perceived by the five senses. In fact, there is an entire language and an entirely different way of communicating with creation that is readily available to all. Only due to the solely left brain perception of reality that has been forced upon them since birth, most people do not even realize such things exist. And it has been so long since most of humanity accessed and used these higher senses that they have simply forgotten the language. When you look at the brain, it's obvious that the two cerebral cortices are completely separate from one another. Our right hemisphere functions like a parallel processor, while our left hemisphere functions like a serial processor. Because they process information differently, each of our hemispheres think about different things, they care about different things, and dare I say, they have very different personalities. Our right hemisphere, it thinks in pictures, and it learns kinesthetically through the movement of our bodies. Information in the form of energy streams in simultaneously through all of our sensory systems, and then it explodes into this enormous collage of what this present moment looks like, smells like, and tastes like, what it feels like, and what it sounds like. I am an energy being connected to the energy all around me through the consciousness of my right hemisphere. My left hemisphere, our left hemisphere, is a very different place. Our left hemisphere thinks linearly and methodically. Our left hemisphere is all about the past and it's all about the future. Our left hemisphere is designed to take that enormous collage of the present moment and start picking out details, details, and more details about those details. It then categorizes and organizes all that information 
associates it with everything in the past we've ever learned and projects into the future all of our possibilities. And our left hemisphere thinks in language. It's that ongoing brain chatter that connects me and my internal world to my external world. But perhaps most important, it's that little voice that says to me, I am. I am. And as soon as my left hemisphere says to me, I am, I become separate. I become a single, solid individual, separate from the energy flow around me and separate from you. We have up here just an entire colony of bees creating some type of amazing magnetic force field around this tree. And this tree is transmitting whatever that is to the ground that I'm sitting on. Whatever this language is that's coming from all these insects, all these species, to and from the earth, back and forth, it's just, it's incredible. And the, the amount of communication that goes into it we still, for some reason, think that we are the center of the universe, even though we try not try to pretend that we're not. Somehow we, we think that everything that happens around here, all the species, they have whatever scientific evidence that we understand. These species pollinate this, those species do this, do that, and the other. And as long as we take care of the species that we need, as long as we take care of all the ecosystems that will sustain us as humanity on this earth, then we'll be fine without understanding that if you were to look at it as this spherical spider web, 360 degrees, we're just a small little portion of it. And yeah, maybe a couple hundred thousand, maybe a million threads or webs would contact us. But when you branch it out and you understand that this entire web is connected to another spot and there's a hundred thousand pieces that connect to that, a hundred thousand pieces that connect to the one down here, and overall, they're all connected in some way, shape, or form. So if you remove one because you don't think it's important enough, we seem to think it's insignificant because there's no direct impact on us. But I think that's such an illegitimate way of looking at it because how could you say that any of this is not profound? How could you say any of it is insignificant when in the long run, it's not by a random occurrence that species grow in certain areas. It's not by a random occurrence that they're are certain animal species in certain areas, certain plants in certain areas, and they all develop this massive ecosystem that feeds each other. How can we not say that specific ecosystems feed other specific ecosystems? How can we not say that the oceans are important to the deserts? How can we not say that all insects and species are important to plant life, important to mineral life? So, in a sense like that, just taking in all of these species that we see around us, taking in absolutely everything that we may not even see within that. The communication between them, we only see it from our perspective, but there has to be thousands, maybe millions, maybe infinite more methods of communication, some type of dialogue between these species and one another. And maybe we don't hear that because it's not necessary for us to, but to respect it. I think respect is one of the most important languages that we've lost, and I think love is the most important language that we've lost. Ancient man had always had a symbiotic relationship with nature and interacted with his surroundings with a degree of understanding and communication that many people of modern times find difficult to even comprehend, let alone exercise. 
Yet, for most of humanity, this symbiotic relationship has now long since disappeared, and the language of nature has been all but forgotten. What happened? What was it that caused man to become so disconnected from the earth? And if civilization continues to follow its present course, how further disconnected are we likely to yet become? As we merge with machines, and I think it's inevitable that we will, uh, we will transform into something new. Transhumanism, the final frontier, or the final prison? Does it represent humanity reaching its greatest potential or facing its greatest threat? Over the last century, the people of Earth have continuously become more disconnected, both from each other and from their surroundings. And by means of a government-controlled education system, the overall IQ of humanity has degraded significantly. And this has been a quite deliberate action. But in our eagerness to embrace technology, one of the most significant problems we are facing is that if one steps back and looks a little deeper at the system we are living within, it becomes glaringly apparent that what this system is in the process of doing is seeing to the removal of virtually everything that makes humanity human, to then usher in a new era. The age of the transhuman anybody who is going to be resisting this progress forward is going to be resisting evolution and and fundamentally they will die out transhumanism is the high-tech dream of both the ruling elite and of numerous modern scientists many of whom are so locked into a left-brain mentality that they see the merging of man with machine as nothing short of inevitable. And due to the lack of any real connection to reality that many people feel in the 21st century, in modern times there are a large number of average people who are actually eager to embrace the idea. And we see kids by the millions going to their doctors and their pastors nowadays saying, I don't feel anything, I don't feel human. And that's a perfect sign of the fact that individuals are no longer even able to identify with the human species anymore because we're already in the midst of the species splitting in two and those being still human and those others being post-human.
As attractive as the concept of simply linking your consciousness up to a mainframe and going online may be to some, human beings are complex and emotional creatures. It's what makes them human. And so the question must be asked, is this evolution? Is this what life is really about? Is this truly where humanity is destined to go? What is a human being? What makes it possible for a biological organism that is around 85% water to function as a sentient life form? Why do human beings experience reality in the manner that they do? And what effect may it have upon human beings if they were to enhance themselves with technology? There is a very, very dark side and an occult side to transhumanism. But I believe that everybody should be able to recognize that if you look at it for what it is, transhumanism represents mankind's desire to escape the human condition. I also personally believe that transhumanism is the religion of the atheists. Much is about upgrades, physically or intellectually, but if you listen to the transhumanists, they said that eventually you'll be able to upload your soul or consciousness to a computer. And at that stage you will basically be able to decide how you would like to live, how long you would like to live, but also the rules that would be surrounding you. Transhumanism is related to technological utopianism, a futuristic science fiction world, a belief that science and technology will shape things for the better, eventually leading to a utopia. Uh, it's an updated version of an old religion, uh, an idea of a new heaven. If you're good, if you believe in Jesus, Allah, Vishnu or Buddha, whoever, you will come to heaven. But much in the same way, if you believe now in science and technology, you are all going to reap the benefits of a new heaven that is going to be created right here on earth. And you are on a quest to better ourselves, evolving toward a state of perfection. Everything that is experienced by a human being is interpreted by the brain as an electromagnetic impulse. Whether it be sight or sound or touch or taste or smell, all perception of these senses are merely electromagnetic signals interpreted by the brain. It can therefore be clearly seen that the human body is in fact an extremely advanced biological computer. And so the real question then becomes, what are the real implications and the real dangers of such a digitally controlled world? And ultimately, why? Why would humanity ever seek to blend something as complex, as highly advanced and as miraculous as the human body computer with something as inorganic and limiting as a machine that has the very real potential of being controlled by an outside source. It's not a matter of whether it's good or bad. It's going to happen. Uh, basically, every two years, we can put twice as many components on a chip. And because they're closer together, they run faster. And so computers get twice as capable overall for the same price every year. We'll make another billion fold increase in price performance in the next 25 years. And again, shrink the size of these technologies 100,000 fold. So we went from a building to something that fits in your pocket in 40 years. In the next 25 years, we'll go from something that fits in your pocket to something that's the size of a blood cell. I believe fully there will be flash memories you can plug into your brain. We'll be able to hook our brains into calculators and statistics programs and have uh, Google directly into the frontal lobes. I mean, the, there's going to be a lot of expansion of the mind through interfacing the human brain with, with technology. I see as a person, I'm human, 
and I'm really limited and restricted in what I do. So if I could come out of the singularity being mentally and physically upgraded, yeah, I'd go for that. So I, I don't mind changing dramatically from what I am. Everything that characterizes what's human and what you know and all your experiences could be uploaded into the internet and run on a computer. In here we can be anything we want to be. I'll see you on the inside. When you are completely identified with your ego, which is a fiction that we choose to believe in, then that's the same as believing in the constructs of a computer to be what you are. This universe is mine. I am God here. The ego is just different cycles and programs of energy running in circles without any purpose to it other than just instant gratification. And that's post-humanity. And we're already in the thick of it. What we have in modern times is a species with only 3% of active DNA indoctrinated into using only one side of their brain that exists in a debt-based society in which every single person within it is required to pay to live in what is essentially temporary accommodation as our modern consumerist-based societies build very little that is actually designed to last. Whether they are truly aware of it or not, modern human beings live their entire adult lives in a largely unnoticed system of slavery, and this can easily be seen when one truly absorbs the implications of paper being more important than people. And now imagine this taken one step further, and having each person locked into a digital world in which it would be an easy task to permanently lock human consciousness into a completely false reality, enslaved into a state of permanent debt forever. And if you question your captors or refuse to work, if you decide you would be better off free, then what then? Transhumanism may well be presented to the world as a method of improving mankind, yet the question must be asked, in a corporate controlled world, exactly what constitutes an improvement? Because looking at things from a commercial and corporate perspective, what may be seen as an improvement to one class may in fact be severely detrimental to another. The field of synthetic biology is a new frontier of science. Using nanotechnology, its goals are to improve and transcend the limits of nature. Human enhancement is being sold to us as leaping tall buildings in a single bound and having better, faster, higher intelligence, perfect health. But all of that is the sales pitch. Enhancement may in fact be degradation, our being devolved to someone else's specifications. For instance, a specimen that can work 18 hours a day, a specimen that is sterile, that will never have the responsibility of caring for others, a specimen that is even-tempered, with a narrow, predictable range of expression. All this is enhanced, improved. We approach two paths. One is based on becoming divine by expanding our consciousness. The other path is focused on becoming God in a materialistic way, using technology. I believe both will become reality, revealing the soul of the decider. We should choose carefully. For the first time in all of human history, mankind is politically awakened. That's a total new reality. And most people know what is generally going on, generally going on in the world, and are consciously aware of global iniquities, inequalities, 
lack of respect, exploitation. The combination of the two, a diversified global leadership, politically awakened masses, makes a much more difficult context. Most people at some period in their life experience what one might perhaps call a lucid moment. A moment when they look at life around them and they think, is this it? And then it suddenly hits them that there must be something more, that there is something more to life. Many people instinctively know that there is a great deal more to reality than what can be perceived with the five senses. But because most people think only with their left brain, they believe that connection to these realms can only be achieved through external technology, through science. A very good example of this is the internet. People find the internet with its instant connection to others and its instant access to information to be quite natural. In fact, there are many people today who simply cannot imagine life without it. The internet, in its own sense, unites humanity as one organism, able to communicate with itself spontaneously. And this becomes more true each day as more countries and more people come online. In this growing web of communication, we can clearly see the unification of mankind becoming a reality. But it is a digital version of it. One could almost say that the internet as we know it today is the central nervous system of a new humanity. A humanity that is vastly different from anything that has previously existed. As much as it has in many ways been a huge boon to our lives, the internet has also had another less noticeable and somewhat more disturbing effect upon people in that among some sections of society it has created an environment of separation, most especially among the youth, as it has brought about a situation wherein many people feel far more comfortable in the virtual world provided for them by the internet than they do in the real world that exists around them. Due to this fact alone, the internet has been single-handedly responsible for a huge loss of skill. A loss of skill not only in areas of practical hands-on survival and life skills, but also in areas of social and interpersonal communication. And it is also interesting to note that people with such characteristics would indeed be those most likely to embrace the merger between man and machine. The internet, cell phones, all these other things that they've definitely enhanced our, uh, our speed of communication, but they've also done something very important and they've severed a very crucial tie between actually talking to people looking into their eyes when you're talking to them, getting a feel for what they're actually feeling, and just in, in the simple fact that now everything is based upon language. We send language through the internet, we send language through the phone, language comes across uh, through the television, and fortunately they're able to give a couple pictures and symbols and things like that, but other than that it's just based upon the language, and it's so disconnected from actual reality, nobody ever stops and sits anymore and just sits inside uh, an actual uh, environment that is natural and just stops and listens to understand that that's reality because when we're talking, when we're jabbering, when we're watching something, when we're striving for something, when we're looking for this money, when we're looking for this car, when we're just going and going and going, that's nothing more than just a, uh, a hamster on a, on a wheel, just running and running and running, not really getting anywhere and that's where the disconnect comes in. There's no nature in that anymore. We've completely divorced ourselves from nature. We are devoid of it now because all in all it all comes back to this little tube that sits in the corner of our room and tells us what reality is. And we sit there and we digest it and digest it and digest it until eventually we realize that this is just another form of poison and all the poison is doing is disconnecting us. Right in the comfort of our own homes simply by pushing a button and turning a dial. Well, transhumanism is the, is the next stage on from where we are now. I mean, we, we have what I call the body computer, this biological body computer. 
and uh, because those in the shadows understand that that's what it is and that we are like in a cosmic version of the wireless internet you've got this kind of infinite energy field of information of, 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 of various depths and various uh, levels of, of, of awareness and expansion and then you're decoding this bit of the band now if you decode this bit of the band which is what this body does then that's your world that's your everything um, if you're just only aware of that and so we, we have a, a global population that is constantly um, programmed to read a certain band and then only some of that band within it and, and through that they are manipulating us to see self and the world in very minute uh, uh, um, limited terms when if we just opened our minds to consciousness we would then start going further and further into the band and getting more and more insights more and more knowledge more and more awareness and suddenly we'll see what's going on and it seems to me that transhumanism is the next stage on for on from that where they go the next stage into into locking us into this this robotic cyborg state so that we are even beyond the limitations that we are now to the point where Basically, uh, you, you are born a robot, you live a robot, and you, you die a robot with, with um, less and less impact on, on the, the, the conscious self, on perceptions, on behavior, on, on actions. And if we get to that point, which is what they want, there's a guy in, uh, in Britain, a very strange man called Professor Warwick. He's famous for being implanted, he's at Reading University for being implanted so he can turn the freaking television on and off with his arm and all this crap. And, but he, he once said, um, what's the problem with loving your servitude? What, what is the problem with, with, with having basically technological uh, um, connections which are feeding you a sense of happiness? so that you're always happy. He said this, this guy's an academic in Britain. And of course what he's talking about, Max, is um, Brave New World, Older Susley, Love Your Servitude. The idea is to create this, this, well I almost said part human, very little part human, certainly almost nothing part consciousness, stroke technological being, which is nothing more than, than a servant of, 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 of a system. And not only does it serve the system, it likes serving the system because it's being fed um, information telling it that it's happy to serve the system. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's beyond science fiction where these people want to go, but that's, how they, that's where they want to go. And the only answer to it is consciousness, is to, is to, is to, is to break out before we get into this cyborg um, part biological computer part technological computer um, break out of this uh, perception control that we have now the level we do now before it gets into that level because then they, they want to move towards that very quickly you don't have to uh, wonder about the singularity to see remarkable changes coming from technology look at today and how remarkable technology is and it's hardly stopping. There's an unanswered question of how far can you go and still be human. Technology is surely a wonderful thing, but by the same token, there can be no denying that via the manipulation of what technologies are released to the public based on their ability to generate income rather than on the true benefits they hold, then the more technology man acquires, the more disconnected from the earth he seems to become. And it must also be clearly understood that technology itself is not the problem. Technology has most certainly been of huge benefit to our society and it is nothing to be scared of. However, it needs to be kept in balance and used as a service to mankind. But what actually is transhumanism? What does it really mean? The transhumanist dream is perhaps best summed up by Ray Kurzweil at the close of his film Transcendent Man. And as positive and beneficial as the idea is presented to the viewer as being, the underlying tone is of the gradual assimilation of all life upon the earth and indeed the entire universe into one huge nanomachine 
whereby the universe will become intelligent as if it wasn't already, and at which point man himself will have created the machine god transhumanists believe human consciousness will ultimately become. In the future, everything will become intelligent. Nanobots will infuse all the matter around us with information. Rocks, trees, everything will become these intelligent computers. So at that point, we're going to expand out into the rest of the universe. We'll be sending basically nanotechnology infused with artificial intelligence. Swarms of those will go out into the universe and basically find other matter and energy that we can then harness to expand the overall intelligence of our human machine civilization. So the universe will wake up, it'll become intelligent, and that will multiply our intelligence trillions of trillions fold. You know, we can't really fully contemplate. And that's really the main reason this is called the singularity. But regardless of what you call it, it will be the universe waking up. So does God exist? Well, I would say not yet. We are the Borg. Lower your shields and surrender your ships. We will add your biological and technological distinctiveness to our own. Your culture will adapt to service us. Resistance is futile. One must truly ask, is this the direction mankind should really be heading? But even more importantly is the question of whether mankind is actually being given any choice in the matter. And if the answer is no, then the next question is how might such a thing as the global implementation of the transhumanist agenda as outlined by Kurzweil actually be achieved without the knowledge of the general population? Biotech is an exploding frontier. It is clever enough and small enough to enter and change our very cells. When nanobiotech has a firm footing in us, it will be easy to upgrade and downgrade anyone and anything in any way. Oliver Curry, an evolutionist at the London School of Economics, predicted in 2007, the human race will one day split into two separate species, an attractive, intelligent, ruling elite and an underclass of dim-witted, ugly, goblin-like creatures. Technology is only ever as dangerous as the mind of whomever wields it. And if those who hold the reins of power in this world can in any way be appraised according to their track record, then for the bulk of mankind, transhumanism presents itself as a very dire future indeed. If it were possible to achieve the dream of people such as Ray Kurzweil and create a world where even the plants and rocks were fused with intelligent nanotechnology, how might such a thing be done? Very notably and quite obviously due to their microscopic size, the prospect of doing so without the knowledge of a vast amount of the population must be seen as utterly plausible. But how could such a mammoth undertaking be implemented? What delivery system could be employed to ensure the widest and most effective method of reaching the subject population?
the phenomenon known to the alternative research community as chemtrails and referred to by the British and United States governments as geoengineering or climate remediation is perhaps one of the most controversial topics on the table today. Even though the practice of climate remediation is widely admitted to by governments, there are many who remain sceptical. And generally the two main questions brought up by those who are opposed to the concept are one, if there was any truth to the idea then why would the perpetrators be spraying themselves? And two, the phenomenal cost of such an enormous undertaking. People say the government is up there in airplanes spraying all kinds of chemicals to change or manipulate the weather, leaving what you see there and they call that a chemtrail. This is of interest, not just in this country, but uh, European countries and frankly all over the world. A lot of folks interested in it. We take geoengineering to mean deliberate, large-scale intervention in the Earth's system. The little picture is from a nanofabrication study, which shows you can make very high quality and do this in just a jet in a very simple way. Aerosol geoengineering looks like it is so cheap that the cost is basically not going to be an issue. Because nanoparticulates are potentially self-replicating, the cost of producing them is actually quite negligible. As for the question as to why the perpetrators would be spraying themselves, well that answer is in fact a very simple one. These people want transhumanism. In fact, when one truly considers the transhumanist agenda, and it begins to sink in that chemtrails seem to consist of nanoparticulates or smart dust, then the last piece of the puzzle falls snugly into place. And it is far from inconceivable that were the global population to be infused with programmable nanoparticulates, then when these tiny machines are switched on, they will simply do what they are programmed to do. And that what this may be may also be largely due to what other genetic codes have first been introduced into the host. We have more than tripled the numbers of doses of vaccines we're giving our children in the last quarter century. Up to 15 by the age of six. Why are so many highly vaccinated children so sick? The elites, those who can afford to carry out practices such as chemtrails, generally don't eat processed or genetically altered food. And it is extremely unlikely that they are subject to the same rigorous vaccination regime as the general public. If mankind is indeed ingesting nanoparticulates without their general knowledge, then how might such machines be controlled or switched on? In answer to this question, one only needs to realise that it is now a long established fact that when anything occurs within the human experience, ultimately the information travels around the body electromagnetically. All our five senses, along with any emotional information, is all interpreted by the brain via these electromagnetic signals. Therefore, it is also an established fact that man can be influenced and even controlled via electromagnetism. Metallic salts have made our air conductive. This means that we and everything around us can transmit and propagate energy. The air is no longer neutral. I think the smart meter is a very good move for the company, for, just for the customer aspect. I mean, they can keep more real-time information on a day-to-day -day basis. The huge awakening that has been seen in recent times leaves little doubt that mankind and consciousness itself is in a state of evolution. But there also exists compelling evidence suggesting that there are certain forces at work who wish to control the direction this evolution will take. The second group of materials found in these environmental samples is unidentifiable fibers. And I really want you to appreciate the meaning of unidentifiable. These fibers have been sent to sophisticated laboratories and there is nothing 
nothing in the databases that match them. These are fibers we could say that do not exist in nature. People around the world are developing lesions on their skin that ooze and produce fibers. This is known as Morgellon syndrome. Tissue samples cultured from ordinary people without this ailment contain and grow the very same fibers. When these fibers are cultured, they produce colonies of filaments. You can see the extension filaments. And these colonies continue to grow and reproduce, branching out into more filaments and more colonies. The filament cultures can be grown from saliva samples, tissue from the skin, mucus, urine, blood, from animals and people, regardless of the presence of the Morgellons condition. So where do these fibers or filaments come from? Airborne environmental samples that were collected by Clifford Carnicom in 2000, the year 2000, gathered at high altitude on a mountain in New Mexico, showed the presence of those fibers whose structure matches exactly the tubular filaments showing up in our blood, tissues, and skin. Additionally, the samples collected by Mr. Carnicum showed what he calls, and was called in biology, desiccated erythrocytes. This is a multisyllabic term, but it means dried red blood cells. So, why are dried red blood cells in the air? See, nano cells are real small. A thousand times smaller than these dust particulates. You inhale it, they go to work replicating, spreading like a virus, multiplying in exponentials. Six months' time, I could have a hundred million people converted, ditch diggers, porn stars, and presidents. Not one would be the wiser. A hundred million people who buy what I want them to buy and do pretty much damn well anything I figure they ought to do. Those unidentifiable filaments, he has observed the formation of red blood cells and submicron sized structures. So now you've got a filament making its own red blood cells. The engineered cells, the red blood, very, very tough, withstanding excesses of heat and chemicals, indicating that they are designed to endure almost anything. He has put them in a Bunsen flame, he has poured bleach on them, acid, and they still endure. In addition, they are able to replicate, growing outside of the body in a petri dish. This is highly sophisticated technology, going on by itself, not in a laboratory. People with advanced Morgellons syndrome started with fibers coming out of their skin, and they're now observing very strange crystalline forms and metallic devices, plaque structures, even grooved metallic devices. On the right, you'll see one device, the front and the back. The fiber strands that you see here were made of cellulose and GNA. GNA is DNA's chemical cousin. It's a nanotechnology building block. The nanostructures contain additional properties not found in DNA, including the ability to form mirror image structures. Here you have a nano array, a tiny device used in biotech for DNA hybridization. And on the left you see a diagram from an industry website of a nano array and on, on the slide you can see actually two of them. She's marked them with red X's that came out of her body looking exactly like this. So we begin with the emergence of basic filaments followed by more complex structures. So what processes are going on here? Are these materials combining to form devices that are working together inside us? What is happening to our biology? And remember that Tissue samples obtained from ordinary people who have no Morgellon symptoms, no lesions, can be cultured to produce the very same filaments found in people with Morgellons. So we would have to conclude that Morgellons is like the canary in the coal mine and that only some people are exuding the materials. And could that be because their bodies are rejecting it while our bodies are integrating it? There has been a force that is mostly unseen in control of this planet for an extremely long time. And evidence very much suggests that this force is attempting to manipulate the evolution of human consciousness that is currently taking place. 
It is very likely the same force that first reduced mankind to the impaired state we now find ourselves in. Where our pineal gland is closed, thereby cutting us off from our higher senses, and where our DNA is 97% dormant, whereby each person is reduced to operating to only 3% of their actual capability. When one examines the evidence and steps back to take in the entire picture, there can be no doubt that the vast majority of human beings live their lives quite literally in a socially and biologically induced trance. And it is due to this trance-like state of the people that we now find the world in such a degraded state. Therefore, the solution becomes clear. Mankind must awaken. But how? How do we transform the collective human trance into wakefulness? How do we bring about the mass awareness of the people? And what steps can be taken to allow both humanity and the earth to once again return to a natural state of abundance? Clearly the first step is for people to understand and accept the truth regarding the current condition of mankind and the urgency of addressing the situation we are faced with. But even when people know the truth, as many do, most are simply waiting. Waiting for social or financial Armageddon. Waiting for December 21st, 2012. Waiting for ascension or waiting for the rapture. And due to this lack of positive and decisive action, while people wait for redemption to be delivered to them via an outside source, the destructive machine of modern civilization continues to grind slowly forward towards its inevitable conclusion. Obviously, it is extremely important for mankind to truly grasp the depths of the problems we are facing and to the peril that our collective failure to deal with things has placed us in. And this peril includes not only the human race, but the entire earth and all life upon it. Because if mankind allows the ship of state to continue sailing in its current direction, within possibly three to five generations, we are very likely to have allowed the creation of a world that will no longer support life as we know it. There's an incredible disconnect between reality and what we're fed as reality, such as um, this little electronic box that millions upon billions of homes have now. And we now digest all of our reality from this little electronic tube. None of what we're actually getting in this tube is reality other than the fact that we're watching uh, television. That's it. That's the only portion of that that's actually real. But what we do is we, we lose ourselves then. We almost become too identified. We forget that we're even existent. So we are identified with everything that we're seeing and this becomes our reality. And we forget that not only is this cherry-picked information but above and beyond all that, no one even stops to think that this is somebody's interpretation of what happened in an area. So everything that we're getting is literally somebody else's creation. It's a manufactured idea that's put into this little tube and then projected into us as reality. And that now is the basis for how we act in our society. So the way we dress, the way we talk, what we do, what we're afraid of, what we're attracted to, what we want to drive, uh, the, the house that we want, the money, all these things are driven by somebody else's perception. They're driven mostly by wants of other people and they uh, arrived at those wants from wants from other people and it all comes back to uh, really just the fundamental basis that none of this is reality it's manufactured it's um, it's not really pertinent to our life it's not really profound there's really no importance to it we're just applying value to it because all of these things the clothing and the cars and the job and, and the money and the bank account and why we want this job we don't even understand why anymore because we relate all of our wants all of our desires to what these other people want and what they desire and if you actually get to the core of it we don't even truly want these things we just want the other people around us to see that we have what they want because that gives us a, um, a measure of control or measure of power and it all boils down to a level of security and that's all that all of this really is is the fact that people are following these fashions they don't understand they're following these ideals that they don't understand they're doing it because they want to fit into some identity that they're uh, eventually creating for themselves to be the most secure the most powerful the most prominent the most beautiful the most affluent person 
in that field so that everybody else around will give that person support because they want to be near you and that's all it is we just want this closeness we want this uh, connection with people and unfortunately now we're, we are contriving it we're forcing people to want a connection with us for means that really have no basis in love no basis in real relationships so all of our relationships are based upon power and fear and based upon uh, manipulation and lies and trying to get this and trying to get that and none of its true interaction anymore science is great with all the beautiful technologies but many of the problems you're trying to solve we created if things stay as usual if business stays as usual then we have about hundred years of life on this planet but if you think there is hope then we have to start taking action right now Indeed, if heavy industry and the genetic manipulation of the Earth environment is allowed to progress at its current rate, then the only life that will be able to survive on Earth will need to be of a very robust nature. Such life would be transhuman by necessity. Biology divides life into three kingdoms, bacteria, archaea and eukarya. Bacteria and archaea are simple organisms with no subcellular compartments. Eukarya are complex with defined cell compartments and internal organelles, mini organs like mitochondria that make DNA and energy for the cell. Plants, animals and humans are eukaryotic as are fungi and slime molds. The archaea are the hardiest of the life forms. They're able to withstand grinding pressure, heat, acidity, and alkalinity. They can live in volcanoes, geysers, and the ice shelf. Now the materials appearing within these filaments are as tough as archaea. They look like bacteria, and they self-replicate. And natural fibers would be classified as fungal in the domain of eukaryotes. But these fibers contain forms from the other two groups inside them. You're looking at a tubular fiber with self-replicating internal elements resembling bacteria and behaving like archaea. That does not happen in the natural world. They are designed to endure almost anything. In the social and political climate of the 21st century, mankind is truly facing some very great challenges. Many of them made all the more difficult due to the fact that they are challenges that go mostly unnoticed by the vast majority of people. The vast majority of people in the world today only perceive the world the way it appears on the surface. However, the real truth is that the world that we live in today is actually very different to that which most people perceive it to be. Because just below the surface of everyday life, beneath the social and political distractions of the reality offered to the masses via their television, there exists another world. The world that most people perceive is simply a facade. It is an illusionary reality where nothing is what it seems. It is a world where our social system is designed to foster division, our education system is designed to conceal knowledge. Our health system is designed to create sickness. Our financial system is designed to steal wealth. Our community is designed to create disunity. And our very civilization itself is wholly uncivilized. We live in a world where 2% of the population controls 98% of the global resources while the other 98% of people are left to compete against each other in order to gather some small fraction 
of the other 2% that is left to them in order to support their lives and their families. In fact, the world of today is so disjointed and so out of balance that the most amazing part of it all is that there are actually people who cannot seem to see it. And this is because the systems of control that have been put in place to blind people to the true realities of our world have been very cleverly and very meticulously constructed. Though much of our society may appear to be free on the surface, if the truth be known, mankind is actually far from free. We are simply free range, for the world of modern times is actually a very controlled place. But the situation is not wholly lost, for the simple truth is that mankind has allowed their servants to take over the mansion. And these public servants have worked and are continuing to work to steal everything of value that they can from the people, while gradually enslaving the world to a set of rules of their own contrivance. Legislation that has been cleverly designed to remove actual law from the planet and impose in its stead the will of individuals. When one puts all the pieces of the puzzle together on the table, the chemtrails, the Harper rays that are appearing all over the planet, the promotion of wireless technology, the smart meters, the introduction of repressive legislation such as Codex Alimentarius, the mandatory use of Monsanto genetically modified food, the destruction of the water table, the introduction of brain inhibiting toxins such as fluoride into people's diets, it becomes quite evident that the ruling factions on this planet are actively engaged in the genetic modification of all life on this planet in order to further the transhumanist agenda. It is being done quite deliberately and quite purposefully and it is being done with neither the knowledge nor the consent of the vast majority of mankind and all the evidence needed to support this conclusion is right before your eyes if people would simply take the time to look. The truth is that everything we are facing is visible in plain sight and so is its inevitable conclusion. It's just that people tend to focus on their own little symptom and never step back to view the entire structure of our world holistically and thus our response to the problem is compartmentalized, essentially rendering it ineffective. And this is all done by design, because in addressing their respective symptoms, people are trained to believe they have to work within the parameters of the system, rather than addressing the actual root of the problem. Every single government that exists anywhere in the world today is currently operating in breach of the trust that has been granted to it by the people of their nation. And this is true regardless of which country we are talking about. It is true whether it is a government consisting of duly elected politicians claiming to act in the best interest of the people, whether they are acting out of greed or whether they are simply acting through their belief that the system is real. It is true whether it is a military dictatorship falsely declaring a self-granted right to dictate what is good for others. It is true whether it consists of a monarchy that has declared its divine right to rule and supposedly care for its subjects. Because the reality is that every single government or ruling body in the world today is abusing the power granted to it by the people of the nation it governs. Exhibit A. The Earth. The remedy is for mankind to re-establish themselves as who and what they are, because the only ones who have any chance of addressing this situation are the people themselves. The first thing to be done is for people to notice their surroundings and to realize that very simple alternatives to the wantonly destructive direction of our current system exist right now. Carbon at the nanoscale is actually transparent and flexible. 
And when it's in this form, if I combine it with a polymer and affix it to your window, when it's in its colored state, it will reflect away all heat and light. And when it's in its bleached state, it will let all the light and heat through and any combination in between. To change its state, by the way, takes two volts for a millisecond pulse. And once you've changed its state, it stays there until you change its state again. The nanomaterial, two nanomaterials, a detector and an imager, and it takes all the infrared available at night, converts it into an electron in the space of two small films. This is taking infrared radiation, wavelength, converting it into an electron. What if we combined it with this? Suddenly, you've converted energy into an electron on a plastic surface that you can stick on your window. But because it's flexible, it can be on any surface whatsoever. The power plant of tomorrow is no power plant. I can generate energy cleanly, efficiently, and cheaply right where I am. It's my energy. And if I don't need it, I can convert it back up on the window to energy, light, and beam it, line of sight, to your place. And for that, I do not need an electric grid between us. The grid of tomorrow is no grid. And energy, clean, efficient energy, will one day be free. This type of technology exists right now. And the global implementation of such energy systems could begin tomorrow, thereby freeing mankind of its financial shackles and simultaneously circumventing some of the most pollutive industries on Earth. And such technology could be implemented tomorrow if the people simply did so themselves. To begin the process of change from this current destructive society, there needs to be an immediate and global movement of people. The people need to occupy everything, but in order to do so, they first need to occupy themselves. As a society, we need an immediate and global cancellation of all debt, thereby freeing each person from the clutches of financial terrorism that now hold them. And this should be closely followed by a switch to alternative energy devices, such as the carbon energy device demonstrated by Justin Hall. And these steps need to be implemented by the people themselves. It cannot be done from within the legal parameters provided by the current system, as the current system simply will not allow it. It won't allow it because the current system is designed not to service mankind, but rather to protect and sustain itself at mankind's expense. Such a process of change will only ever succeed if it is implemented by the people themselves, regardless of what legislation has been put in place to prevent them from doing so because legislation is not law. Legislation is simply rules written on pieces of paper by public servants. Rules designed to eradicate actual law from existence and to impose the will of a ruling cartel in its place. To then impose itself upon mankind's very genetic and biological structure to serve a transhumanist agenda designed to enslave the entire human race while all the wealth of this earth is stolen from them. And the only thing that stands in the way of this program running to its inevitable conclusion are the people themselves. But the biggest killer, the wielder of the ultimate power against mankind, the most all-pervasive force that has kept the people of the world enslaved for so long, is fear. People often talk about the need to adopt an attitude of love, and in many ways they do so, but then through inner fear, they fail to apply it to reality around them. Each should ask themselves, if suffering exists in the world around me, and I fail to address it, then am I really in a state of love and service to creation, or am I simply in a state of fear and denial of reality? 
Admittedly, it is often difficult for people to see through the haze, not only for people who are now beginning to see how the world works, but also for others who have been long active and yet unwittingly only focusing on a symptom rather than on the actual problem. And this is because when you look at all the little symptoms, it's chaos and far too difficult for most people to really make anything out because nothing really makes sense. It's just a barrage of information and of disinformation. It doesn't begin to make any real sense until you begin to look at things holistically and then it all falls neatly into place. Though often, even when the real problem is clearly seen, most people simply point the finger and fail to see the actual solution. It is time for each person on this planet to remember who and what you are and to never lose focus of the fact that government was created by mankind in order to service mankind's needs, not the other way around. So you must always, always question authority. If someone in fancy dress interferes with your ability to be yourself to your fullest potential, if you have always respected others and there is no injured party from your actions, then you should always question what right anyone has to compel you to perform any action or to make any demands of you at all. As more and more rules are put into place, mankind is becoming increasingly more regimented. We now find police officers stationed on school grounds, as what was once a childhood prank and part of growing up is now often seen as a breach of law, a crime. Self-expression is frowned upon unless it is carried out under strict supervision. And at the rate our regulatory bodies are going, Eventually, society will no longer tolerate any individuality at all. Eventually, it will be illegal to even think outside of the box. Essentially, illegal to be truly human. The truth of the matter is that the people of this world are, even now, living in a very low-security open-air prison. And the only ones who can implement the positive change required to escape it and to pave the way for a free humanity are the people themselves. The solution has been there all along, for the solution lies with the people. It is always laid with the people, and all that is really required for mankind to escape from the prison that enslaves us is for people to realize the truth of the invisible bars that surround their minds, and to realize that the bars are only there due to people's belief that the system is real. The only reason you have to pay land rates, pay taxes, succumb to the will of greedy corporations and adhere to legislation created by corrupt government bodies and designed to remove your liberties. The only reason all the modern world finds itself in a position where it is virtually enslaved by public servants is because you live in a divided society and to people's failure to build common unity within their community to get to know their neighbours, to support each other and to see each other as valid. People have been taught to judge others by their differences, to play the blame game, to point the finger at another and to voice their anger for their hardships and feel that they have achieved something, when by doing so they are simply perpetuating the division and effectively missing the actual problem altogether. Our leaders have replaced true and natural law with a set of rules of their own contrivance. And these rules have served to rob mankind of our earth and of our heritage. And we the people, the 99%, are truly the only ones who have the power to effect positive change. An alternative way of doing things, a system that empowers and frees the populace, will never be implemented via the means of the system that currently enslaves them. There is no legal remedy, no remedy in politics, no remedy in government. There can and will only ever be remedy found in natural law and in a population willing to honour it. And so now, more than ever, it is time for mankind to act and to clearly understand who we are. The most important thing we can do in the present moment is to realize that we each have the ability 
to peacefully but firmly stand to stop the further destruction of our water table and to prevent the rest of the transhumanist infrastructure from being put into place. And most importantly, to connect with our community and to lead by example in all that we do. And together we can easily reclaim our heritage and our birthright. But it will not be done while there is judgment or accomplished through violent revolution. Nor are they needed because all it would take is mutual respect and a united act of non-compliance to a fictional system that enslaves the minds of almost all who inhabit this world due to people's belief that the system is real. Civil disobedience is not something outside the realm of democracy. S democracy requires civil disobedience. Without civil disobedience, democracy does not exist. You see, the solution lies with each of us. It lies with me and it lies with you. And it lies in a simple choice between love and fear. Indeed, the path to remedy, the path to positive change, the path to alter the direction the ship of state is now sailing is right at our feet. All that is required is to take the first step. In Lakesh. It's quite comical, actually, when you realize the difference between reality and what some people are talking on TV about. You took the mark of the devil just so you can eat and breathe. Bows down at the feet and surrender liberty. Tyranny and terror corrupt the dictators. Posing as your leaders while they poison every leader. Pumping for it in the water while they rape Iraqi daughters. Thumbing down the public fashion magazines and fodder. Now they slaughter weaker nations. Fault the explanation, sell a fear to the masses. Terror level elevations, revelations is unfolding. Right before your eyes, wake up in a FEMA camp. Drunk and hypnotized, four strikes taking over. Why you focus on your bling? But I bet by this point you haven't heard a damn thing. It's destruction by design, prophesizing every script. Take a big step back, see the whole picture. A distraction of the mind to keep you living in a bubble. We're in a lot of trouble because less than 3% of you people read books. Because less than 15% of you read newspapers. And when the 12th largest company in the world controls the most awesome goddamn propaganda force in the whole godless world, who knows what shit will be paid off the truth. Problem, action, reaction, solution. It's time to wake up to the formulas they're using. State sponsored terror to burn our constitution. Weapons of mass deception of the media delusions. Using double speak to keep you following like sheep. CNN and Fox News to keep the populace asleep. Never look and never question why we're headed towards recession. The dollar's worth a nickel, but we're ruled by our possession. I mentioned that those towers fell in less than an hour. Ignorance is bliss, the source of the power. But the power in the shadows if we all wake up and see that the land that we're living in. It's nothing close to free It's destruction by design Prophesizing every script Take a big step back See the whole picture A distraction of the mind To keep you living in a bubble We're in a lot of trouble So you listen to me Television is not the truth Television is a goddamn amusement park You're beginning to think That the tube is reality And that your own lives are unreal You do whatever the tube tells you You dress like the tube You eat like the tube You even think like the tube In God's name you the real thing. We are the illusion. Now you're living as a slave, high-tech police state. Warrantless searches and water poured in a waste. Mandatory vaccines to keep you sedated. Big brother on the screen to keep the public isolated. Conspiracy theories, now conspiracy facts. Thought crimes condemn like terroristic attacks. Every time you take a breath, you pay another tax. Every time you take a step, it's documented and tracked. It's whack how we're living. The planet's a prison. You should have listened up and questioned 9-11. Defend our constitution, a public execution of corrupted institutions. It's destruction by design, prophesizing every script. Take a big step back, see the whole picture. A distraction of the mind to keep you living in a bubble. We're in a lot of trouble. Mercury containing vaccines may help not harm kids. According to China, if China were to revalue its currency, or China is to start making, say, toys that don't have lead in them.
or food that isn't poisonous, their costs of production are going to go up. And that means prices at Walmart here in the United States are going to go up too. People out there in our nation that don't have that, and uh, I believe that our ed education, like such as in South Africa. First, the Fox News alert. Coalition forces have discovered 500 chemical munitions in Iraq. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack. And how is Ron Paul's number so high? Clearly, uh, some online communities are messing Absolutely. with the, uh, the outcome. Live, uh, all hell is breaking loose on 6th Avenue. Uh, you know, you need a permit to protest or demonstrate here in New York. But this anarchist group came forward. They really are the, one of the least attractive groups of demonstrators I've ever seen. <laughs> they, uh, uh, I bet uh, one of the leaders, I guess, if violence breaks out, don't worry, we can handle it. Our, uh, our Fox News team can take this bunch of... Uh, <laughs> I don't want to use any foul language.